Hello everyone, I'm Anita and welcome to the Bible Roadmap. Hello everyone, welcome once more to my channel. I am Anita Ramra Bali coming to you all the way from Trinidad and Tobago down in the Caribbean and this is my channel Woman at the Well where we talk all things kingdom. I am a preacher of the word of God and I'm here to share with you my program entitled The Bible Roadmap. And currently we are in the book of Genesis. We are gonna be taking a journey from the book of Genesis all the way down to the book of Revelation, exploring these wonderful books of the Bible. And where we left off last time was in the book of Genesis. So I wanna pick back up from there, from Genesis chapter 10. And um, just to give you a little recap, we were talking about the flood and life after the flood where Noah came out of the ark with his three sons, his wife, his son's wives. And we saw when Noah fell into sin, you know, he got drunk and his son Ham, you know, came in and saw the nakedness of his father and Ham was cursed, well actually not Ham, um, Noah cursed his ham son, which was Canaan. Canaan became cursed. So we want to pick it up from there. All right. Um, Genesis chapter 10. And today we're going to look at the spread of man after the flood. The spread of man after the flood. Um, and if we really go, to, if we really take this into context, we would see this is the spread of man for the second time since creation. When Adam and Eve were originally placed on the earth, God gave them the mandate to be fruitful, to multiply, and to fill the earth. And we know that they fell into sin, sin spread among mankind, and sin became so rampant and so horrific that God had to do a cleansing and a purging of the wickedness of the world, but he found this man called Noah to be faithful, to be righteous in his eyes, and he saved Noah and his sons. And the rest of the earth was eliminated, the rest of human humanity was eliminated. And now we have Noah and his sons coming out of the ark and receiving that same commission to be fruitful, to, be, to multiply and to fill the earth. And right after that, we saw Noah fell into sin because humanity is now under the curse of sin, regardless of how righteous a person can be. The sin nature always leads humans astray. All right, so let's look at the spread of man. There were some very interesting facts I came across when I was um, researching the genealogy of Noah and the spread of you know his seed from that point onward. So we know that his sons that came out of the ark with him, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But where did this all take place? Where, did that, where is this happening in the world? Which part of the world is this happening? So Noah, it's, it, it's said that Noah lived in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is actually a word used in the Bible. We will see it in scripture. Um, this is the land situated between and around the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, okay? so. The Greek word Mesopotamia literally means in the midst of the river. So if you look at a map, you're gonna see the two rivers coming down like this. And that area in the midst of the rivers was termed Mesopotamia. All right, so Mes Mesopotamia does not, that the term Mesopotamia does not exist today. However, today, the, the, the land that is that was Mesopotamia is now what we would um, see as part of northern Iraq extending to eastern Turkey and the extreme northeast of Syria. So that general area is what would have been termed Mesopotamia in the days of Noah, even in the days of Abraham as we're going to see later on, right? So Mesopotamia plays a considerable role in the Old Testament history, including the story of Noah. And much of the narrative in the first 11 chapters of Genesis is focusing on this region. So Genesis 10, 11, this is where it's, it's gonna be taking. This is where all the action is taking place, okay? So it is assumed also that the Garden of Eden was in this general vicinity. Notice I said it was assumed, 
do not quote me on that. This is what researchers have, you know, they have come up with this estimation that this would have been where the Garden of Eden was. This would have been where civilization began with Adam and Eve. All right? Two of, because two of the rivers in Eden are identified as Euphrates and Tigris. So it could very well be that this was the location of the Garden of Eden. And it makes sense because the spread of man after Adam and Eve would have been, uh, uh, sorry, the spread of man after Adam and Eve, and then when we look at where Noah was situated in the description, it kind of makes sense, it kind of lines up that this was the general area that all of this was taking place, okay? So after the flood, the Bible says that the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat, and this currently, this region is currently modern day Turkey, so that gives you an idea of where all of this was taking place. It, you know, I, I love history and I love to look at not just the spiritual um, aspect of the Bible, I love to examine the historical aspect of the Bible because when, when I do that, it, it makes me realize it's actually, it's something that took place. It's not just a story in a book because you know, you might hear the word Mesopotamia or the mountains of Ararat, and you might think like that was probably some kind of mystical place. But when you actually think that, hey, the mountains of Ararat is, is, is where currently modern day Turkey is, then it, it, it kind of brings you to, you know, that idea of, hey, this actually took place. It does, it, you know, so I, I love the historical part of the Bible and it makes me appreciate the word of God even the more. And that's why I'm sharing it with you. And it's good to have context, right? So um, this is where the mountains of Ararat and it's likely that no one's family lived in Mesopotamia after the flood as well. Um, so we're going to look at the spread of man. Now in the book, in Genesis chapter 10, Let's, let's read here what it says. Now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, Teras. It keeps going on. If you read the entire chapter of Genesis 10, which I encourage you to go and do, you would see the genealogy of Noah's sons. But what is very interesting, I wanna show you how some of the, the civilizations that we know today came out of those sons of Noah. And I'm reading from the Enduring Word Commentary, that site, and I'm just gonna give you a little bit. I can't read all, because it's a lot, and you can actually go and read it up for yourself. Um, it, it was really interesting to see how some of the civilizations that we know today came out of the sons of Noah. It really opened my eyes, so here we go. So the sons of Japheth, all right, were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, Tyrus. So here's what they say about the sons of Japheth, that he was the father of the Indo-European peoples, those stretching from India to the shores of Western Europe. So we see here that the sons of Japheth, now after they, after they had their, their children, they would have spread out they would have spread out across the continent. They would not have remained in one place. So we're seeing how they're spreading out now and they're occupying different territories, which would become the lands that we know today as India, as China, as Russia. So I'm, I'm just gonna continue on. So we see that the Indo-European people stretching from India to the shores of Western Europe were out of the sons of Japheth, all right? Um, Gomer, from this son of Japheth came the Germanic peoples from whom came the most of the original people of Western Europe. These include the original French, Spanish, and Celtic settlers. And then we have Magog, Tubal, Meshesh, Meshek. These settled in the far north of Europe and became the Russian people. I found this very exciting. As I said, I love history. Um, we look at Madai, that from this son of Japheth came the ancient Medes and they populated what are now Iran and Iraq. The peoples of India also came from this branch of Japheth's family. So we also see Javan, from this son of Japheth, came the ancient Greeks, whose seafaring ways are described in Genesis 10, 5. It's so exciting to see how people began to spread 
how they began to occupy different territories and they began to birth different nations, yeah? And it goes on to talk about the sons of Goma, the sons of Javan. But one thing I want to show, to show you here, if you look at Genesis chapter 10, verse 15, let's, let's look at something very interesting. Let's look at Canaan. And why I want to look at Canaan is this. When Noah, when Noah placed the curse because of Ham's sin, he placed it on Canaan and he said that Canaan would be cursed a servant of servant he shall be to his brethren. So we know that because of the curse placed on Canaan, his descendants were cursed. But I want to show you who the descendants are. Let's look at Genesis 10, chapter 15. I apologize for that little glitch in um, the video. I don't know what happened, but my video just cut in the middle of my recording. So here I'm going again. So I was talking about Canaan and the curse that was placed in Canaan. And something very interesting that popped out at me while I was studying um, Genesis 10, 15. Let's look at it. Canaan begot Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, the Jebusite, the Amorite, and the Girgashite, the Hivite, the Archite, and the Sinite, the Arvadite, the Zemurite, and the Hamathite. Afterwards, the families of the Canaanites were dispersed. Now, all these people, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, when you read later down in the book of Genesis, and even when you look at the book of Joshua, when the Israelites are going into the Promised Land, these are the people who will be their enemies, who will have to fight, who they will have to conquer in order to enter the Promised Land. So here we see the origin of why these people were enemies of the, 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 um, the Israelites because of the curse that was placed on Canaan. So then that's why, because um, the genealogy of the rest of people that would come out of, 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 of Noah's sons, Shem, out of Noah's sons, Shem would be the one out of his genealogy would come the man called Abraham. So this curse was there from way back when. It's very interesting that when God speaks or when a servant of God speaks or when a curse is placed, it can endure for generations. Whatever, you know, um, that person, um, I, I just personally felt, this is me, that it was unfair that Canaan was cursed. That's just my take on it. And sometimes we can't understand why people do the things they do. However, the curse existed and the curse spread through generations. So those Jebusites, Amorites, Girgashites, they were, they became idol worshippers. They became pagans. They strayed very far from God. And if you examine the lifestyle of these people, a lot of them were, as I said, idol worshippers, but they were also um, involved in child sacrifices. And you, could, you will see later down that when God instructed the Israelites to go into the promised land, he instructed um, um, Joshua and, his, and the rest of the army to wipe them out. And you might see, you might, it might seem cruel. However, when you look at the lifestyle that they were involved in, they were involved in terrible practices, one of which was child sacrifices. And God could not have afforded to leave those kind of people existing around because the things that they were doing were so horrific. So it was a type of judgment that was brought on them. And I just want to make that connection and show you that, you know, the sons of Canaan were cursed and the Canaanites were cursed and they became, they became very wicked people and they were always enemies of the Israelites. That's where it, it stemmed from. All right, so let's move on. And we, so we know that the genealogy of the you know, son, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, people began to spread across the continent and began to occupy different territories. And we, let's look at the genealogy of Shem, because out of the genealogy of Shem is where the man called Abraham came out of, right? So if you look at verse 21, you will see children were born to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the sons of Shem were Elam, Asher, a lot of names, some of which I can't pronounce. I'm not even gonna try, <laughs> you know. Um, but we read there that here is Shem, and they occupied, the Bible say, the mountainous, uh, let me see. 
They said their dwelling place was on Misha as you go towards Sepha, the mountains of the east. All right. So we are examining this because later we are going to soon come to this man called Abraham. All right. Um, so let's look at Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel. Most people know this story. All right. Um, let's just, just give a little synopsis about Babel. Now, the Tower of Babel was built by the man called Nimrod. All right. Let me give you a little history of Nimrod. Okay. If you look at Genesis 10, verse 8, you would see that out of the sons of Ham, all right, the genealogy of Ham, there came a man called Nimrod. And the Bible says he began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, Kalne, in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, Kala, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala. Now, some of these cities you will see later on in the, new, in the, in the Bible. You, so you understand that this is the origins of those places, especially the one called Nineveh. Because in the book of Jonah, that was the land that God sent um, the prophet Jonah to cry out against and say, you know, you all need to repent or else you'll be destroyed. So it's interesting to see. Like I said, this book of Genesis is so full. It is so full. It's the origins of everything that takes place later on in the Bible. And it's good to understand and get context of where these places came from. But one of the, the things I, when I was researching Nimrod and one of the commentaries, they said that even though the Bible say he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, it was not used in a good context, meaning that Nimrod was not a good person. It's actually the reverse. It's apparently he was wicked. All right, and when we examine the things that he was doing later, when we're going to read the Tower of Babel here, we will see that he indeed was wicked. So he built this kingdom called Babel. All right, now in the Genesis chapter 11, it says, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and that makes sense because they all came out of one family, Noah and his sons, right? And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shana and they dwelt there. Now remember I said this is the whole, everything is taking place in this generalized place called Mesopotamia, okay? Um, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So here they are in Babel, and they are conspiring to make this tower, um, the brick and an asphalt tower, and the goal of it is to make a tower who, that is very high, and it gives the impression of pride. It gives the impression of pride because you are, you, they are trying to make a name for themselves and they are trying to build this tower that goes so high into the heavens. It gives the impression of pride. And when we think about pride, it immediately lines up with Satan because Satan's sin was pride. He was, his heart was raised up with pride. He believed, he believed that he was so great that he wanted to take the place of God. He said, I will ascend to the throne of God. When we look at um, later down, he said, I will ascend to the throne of God. He wanted to ascend and he wanted to take the place of God. And this is, this is the impression that we are getting here, that these people are becoming very prideful and they want to do, they want to make their own name. They don't want to worship God. They don't want... You know, it gives the impression that they want to rule themselves. They don't want anything to do with God. So here's what happens. The Bible says in, in verse 5 of chapter 11, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they have all one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing they propose to do will be withheld from them. Wow. You know, there is a power in the oneness of humanity. And if we use it for good, 
could you imagine what we can do here? Some people using their unity to do something that is displeasing to, to God. And God is saying, listen, my goodness, if they continue this way, then nothing they propose to do will be, will be withheld from them. It makes me think that if we, my goodness, as humanity and as the body of Christ, really have unity, what can we accomplish for the Lord? You know, what can we accomplish doing good on the earth? But I think because of the sin, because of sin, nature, because of pride, because of the influence of the enemy, and because of this innate desire to have power, that we ended up fighting one another, we have no, we barely have unity, we barely have unity. But what strikes me is that when you listen to some of the testimonies, I know that I'm showing a little bit, but I feel led to say this. When you look at some of the testimonies of people who have come out of the kingdom of darkness, I was listening to a testimony of, of this gentleman and he was, uh, 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 he was involved in witchcraft. He was a witch doctor, you know, and he was working for Satan. And when you hear him talk about how organized the kingdom of darkness is, it blows your mind, you know, it blows my mind to think how organized and how cooperative the forces of darkness are with each other because their common goal is to destroy man and to destroy the works of God and to destroy his kingdom. But yet, we who are in the kingdom of God, you know, we fight one another. We have, you see, we don't understand the power we have if we come together as one. One body, one mind, one determined, you know, uh, mindset to say, hey, we are going to do this with the Lord. And yeah, we need to really get to that place. All right, people of God. So here's God saying, we will not have any of this anymore, okay? Enough of this, he said. Because God always has to intervene, right? When people are in the midst of the wickedness and they are doing the most and they are reaching a point of destruction, God has to come in and intervene. He had to intervene. When Adam and Eve sinned, he had to take them out of the garden to save them. Because if they ate of the fruit of the tree of life, they would have remained in their sinful state forever man would not have been able to be redeemed we would have eaten they would have eaten that fruit of the tree of life and remain in that live forever in a sinful body how horrific to even think of so god saved them he took them out of the garden he said the bible said he put cherubim to guard the way and then sin spread again to the point where it was so bad that god had to wipe out all of this wickedness from the face of the earth through the flood, but he saved Noah. And here again, he's seeing, you know, these people engaging in this plot to build this tower and become prideful, and God knows what they would have done with that, you know, who knows what they would have done with that so-called power that they would have had, that God had to come and interrupt their plans again for the good of mankind, you know, just for the good of mankind. And it says the Lord came down, and the Lord said, they are one, and in verse 7, it says, Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. My goodness. Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language. So here is where it says, The Lord scattered them abroad from their old, all the face of the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. So now, language is born, different languages, through God confusing them so that they were not able to communicate. At that point, they were scattered abroad. So we know that they scattered across the, the face of the continent. They went and they inhabited the different places, and they began to um, build their civilization. All right, so let's move on. So we have Shem's descendants, if you read from verse 10. Now, as I said, the genealogy of Shem is repeated here because an important man is coming out from the genealogy of Shem, all right? This is the genealogy of Shem. Shem was 100 years old. He begot Arthax, Ad, two years after the flood. And if you continue reading, you're gonna get all the genealogy, which I won't go into, because it's a lot. So when we get down to verse 24 of chapter 11, it says, 
Naho lived 29 years and begot Terah. After he begot Terah, Naho lived 119 years and begot sons and daughters. Now Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram, not Abraham, because originally his name was Abram, all right? Naho and Haran. This is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Naho, and Haran. Haran begot Lot. So Lot is Abra Abram's nephew, all right? He's the, the son of Abram's brother. Haran died before his father in Terah in the native land in the Ur of the Chaldeans. Then Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. The name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So we see the origins of this man called Abram, and later his name will be changed to Abraham, all right? Um, and his wife is Sarai, her name will be changed to Sarah. God has a way of changing people's name, giving them a brand new identity in him. So to me, that's absolutely beautiful. You know, last night we were watching The Chosen and we saw the episode where, you know, Jesus um, gave Simon the name Peter. And I love when God gives a new name. When he gave Jacob the name Israel, you know, he gives a new name. It's a new identity. It doesn't mean that all of us will get a name change, but it just signifies how God can take something and turn it into something else, some, something beautiful, something wonderful. Just as how he would have done with all our lives, all of us who have received Christ, you know, we were once, however we were, you know, messed up. God knows where we were. And God took us and he gave us a brand new identity in him. Uh, he washed us and he made us clean and he sanctified us by his blood. And he gave us a brand new lease on life a brand new um, you know, way of thinking and it is beautiful to be renewed and to, co to come alive once more, be born again in Jesus Christ, yeah? So let's talk about Abram a little bit and I'm going to talk a little about Abr bit about Abram in Genesis chapter 12. It says, now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is a significant portion of scripture because it signals and it heralds the beginning of this great nation called Israel. But it's actually greater than that. It signifies God's plan of salvation being put into action. When I was actually studying this, what the Holy Spirit began to show me and reveal to me is this. Now, we, we think that, you know, even when you study the word of God and you look at God calling Abraham and making a nation out of Abraham, sometimes we might tend to think that, Israel is so set apart or God loves them more than he loves the Gentiles. But what the Holy Spirit was showing me is that that's not true. Is that Israel was just the first, the, the start point of salvation. It was never God's plan to just save one group of people and leave the rest hanging. All right, it says here in verse three of chapter 12, he said, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abraham, through you, all the families of the earth. It didn't just say one group of people. However, this is a revelation, a divine revelation that the Holy Spirit gave to me yesterday while I was pondering and studying. Is that here, here's what it is. When God created Adam and Eve, he created them to worship him, to be holy, to be righteous before him. However, when Adam and Eve fell into sin, we saw the de demise and the decline of humanity 
that they began to plunge deeper and deeper and deeper into sin, man fell into idol worship. And because man fell into idol worship, they strayed further away from God. They lost all idea of who God was. They, they, they didn't even recognize him as God anymore. I want to read for you from the book of Romans chapter 1 and I want to show you this in verse 18 so you can turn you can check it out Romans chapter 1 verse 18 and it says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them for since the creation of the world here it is his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse. It means to say that from the beginning of time, when God created man, he was revealed to man. He was revealed. His, his invisible attributes means that we could not have seen God, but we, we would have known it had a, there was a God. We would have had a, you know, we would see all around, hey, the, the, the creation, when we look at creation, when you look at creation, you have, you, you can't deny that there is a God. And even apart from that, deep inside the heart of every human being, I don't care if you're atheist or say you don't believe in God, there is something in you that yearns to find your creator. There's something in, intrinsic inside of you that yearns to find out who you are, where you came from, you know, even though you may not be aware of it, and that's why mankind has found themselves straying down so many different paths, trying to find God. You know, if we, we delve into spirituality, spiritual practices, and new age things, and, and all the things that, when, when God is right there in front of our eyes, and here's what the Bible says that in verse 21, because although they knew God, right, the people at the beginning of the world, they knew God, the Bible says they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God, my goodness, into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. So what this verse in Romans is saying is that even though man knew God, they turned themselves foolishly away from him in their own wisdom, and they changed the glory of God into image, an idol, making statues, making, you know, um, things that represent, so-called represent God. We don't need something to represent God. God is God all by himself. And a lot of people say that they worship idols because it's a representation of God. But why do you need a representation of God? He's there. He's available. He's there 24-7 to be available to you, even though you may not see him with your eyes or visible eyes. We know that he's there. So, you know, and, and the Bible continues to say, therefore, this is Genesis, uh, Romans 1, um, 14, sorry, 24. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the loss of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. You know, God is a God of choice. And even though it would have grieved his heart that this is my people who are made and created, and here you are leaving me and creating idols and things that are images of animals. Even in the, in the nation of Israel, you see that when, when Abraham was up in the mountains, they made a golden calf. And God's anger was so, so, so hot against them, my goodness. Um, but this is what humanity does. We have a tendency to leave the original, which is God, and go after practices that we think is going to bring us closer to God. You know, we have so much so-called practices and so much things, and, 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 and when you think about it, it's really kind of ridiculous because God is available right there for us. We don't have to, we have to search for Him, not the thing. And that's why I said people defend 
worshiping idols and they say well, we, we, we're just making a representation we don't need to make a representation he's God he's there all right so yes so back to my point is that man strayed so far from God that they forgot about who he was they began to worship idols they began to do their own thing and in order for God again to save humanity this is the revelation the Holy Spirit gave me I was like wow in order for God to save humanity he had to start with a start point of the man called Abraham pull him out of the world of idolatry because Abraham was a pagan all right when you examine the history of where he was living called Ur of the Chaldeans they were idolatr idolaters they were idol worshippers they were pagans and God is pulling this man out and saying come move out of this place go to a land I will make you a great nation and he began to establish himself with Abraham even as even later down in when 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 he um, when God established the Mosaic Covenant you will see that what God's intention was is to bring humanity back to him establish what is God who is he was showing them and teaching them who he was who I am you know thou shalt not have any gods before me I am the Lord worship me don't worship idols teaching them giving them the commandments teaching them holiness teaching them righteousness trying to get them back in alignment with him not because just because he's God and he's just all almighty God who wants people to bow and worship him but because he loves humanity my goodness it blows my mind because the love of God keeps it just blows my mind that he could have destroyed the earth he never had to save Noah he could have destroyed even after Noah he could have just left humanity to go down the drain but here is God again in his love and also in fulfilling the covenant he made when Eve and Adam sinned in Genesis chapter 3 he, he made a covenant with them right there and that and he said that the seed of the woman will be the, the one to redeem mankind that is why God is now pulling Abraham out he's not just pulling Abraham out to make him alone a nation it just had to start there he had to, you know, he had to renew their thinking. He had to teach them the ways of God, show them holiness, show them righteousness, and establish this nation of holiness and righteousness, out of which the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come. And then, through Jesus Christ, the entire world could receive salvation. Doesn't that make sense? It is beautiful. Because God could not just have left Abraham in his, and say, you know, save Abraham, in the middle of his pagan um, lifestyle. He had to pull him out. He had to show him, come Abraham, come, come out of this place. Let me show you who I am. Let me reveal myself to you. Let me teach you the true nature of the living God. You know, and, and Abraham was obedient. That, you know, I always wonder, like, did God call Abraham with an audible voice? It, I, to me, if, I had, if, if today I just felt in my spirit that God said, Anita, I want you to leave your house, pack up everything, move to another country. Listen, I would question that multiple times. And I would say, God, you have to prove this to me before. I, that's a big move. That's big. Like, that's huge. It's not like you're just making a decision about what to eat today or to, what, what, what to put on or what, what to wear. It's about leaving your entire life behind going somewhere in another nation to live and i know that there are people today who god does call to move from one place to another to do the work of the lord but it always amazes me that one abraham knew god's voice that means to say that something in abraham's heart was for the lord god would have examined his heart and god would have found something in abraham that was worth calling Meaning that he, he, God doesn't just call people just so. You know, even when it, it brings me to that time when God called King David and um, Samuel went to anoint David, when you read in the book of Kings, um, that, you know, it, it, God said, um, I don't want all of the brothers, even though they were physically, you know, fitting the bill. He said, no, I look at the heart. And he chose that ruddy little shepherd boy called David to be king. So what I'm saying is that Abraham's heart would have had something profound in it. And 
If God call you, hear me by the Spirit of God. I'm going to wrap up here today with that. If God call you, despite of what your life would have been, Abraham was an idol worshiper. He was a pagan. His father was pagan. His genealogy was pagans. If God called you in the midst of whatever it is you would have been doing, and he, he pulled you out, he tugged at your heart, he saved you, and he put a gifting inside of you and a calling and a purpose, it means to say that God saw something inside of you that was worth him calling you. And I want you to take that and run with it because so many times, and I'm saying this from experience, when God called me, I was very messed up. I was living in the world. I didn't know anything about ministry. And yet, you know, people would speak to me and prophesy over my life that I would preach the word of God. And I was like, me? Sure. <laughs> you know? um, and that I would do the work of the Lord. And I used to question all the time. I say, God, I don't, I think you, you made a wrong choice because I don't fit the bill. I'm not I'm not holy and righteous and I you know what what God does he does not call the qualified he qualifies the called because when God called Abraham he began to take Abraham through that journey and he began to work in Abraham and he began to reveal himself to Abraham and you know we will see what's going on the line there later on and this is the same thing when God called me he took me through years of pruning and shaping and you know, renewing me, cleansing me, washing me, growing me, you know, and I'm still in the process of growing. We all are, we will never stop growing. But my point is that you who are called, stop doubting yourself. You know, Abraham didn't say, well, who am I? You know, I'm just a pagan idol worshiper God. I think you have the wrong person. It's not me. The Bible says Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, all their possessions. So he packed up lock, stock, and barrel that they had gathered and the people who they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the turban trees of Moreh. And the Canaanites were there in the land. So again, we see that he, he's coming back to meet up the descendants of, of Canaan who are dwelling in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abraham journeyed, going on still toward the south. So even though he reached the land of Canaan, and God said, Abraham, I'm going to give you this land, he kept on journeying. The Bible said the Canaanites were in the land. So it occurs to me that he could not have occupied at that point in time because the Canaanites were in the land. But God brought him there. God brought him there to show him, Abraham, this is the land. He didn't just tell him. He brought him there and he showed him the land. And then he kept on journeying. And you will see that he will go back. He will go back to Canaan. But my point is, and I'm going to wrap up with this. God will show you what he has in store for you way before you get it. He will show you the promises. He will show you the calling. He will show you and he will tell you, this is what you're going to do for me. You're going to do great things for me. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. It's going to take some time to get from that, from that promise to actually walking in the materialization of it. God has to do a work in us before we inherit the promise. He has to prepare us for the promise. He has to prepare us for the promise. Hallelujah. So I thank you for watching tonight. And um, at any point, wherever, whatever time you'll be looking at. Right now it's night. <laughs> and I pray that this has blessed you. And I pray that you will continue watching the Bible room up as we continue um, on that journey in the book of Genesis. Um, but Genesis is so huge. Listen, there is like, oh, so much, so much to be done in Genesis. And I didn't want to rush through. Hey, let, me, let me just tell you this. When I started the Bible roadmap, my intention was to give just a general overview of the, of the books of the Bible. But God always has a different plan because when I started to dig into this thing and I realized how full it was, I just... I had to take it step by step. I have to 
because I, you know, I want people to appreciate the word of God so much that I said, you know what, let's take our time with it. No matter how long it takes, if it takes me a couple of years, we're going to finish this, okay? So we'll see you back. I'll see you back on here next week, God willing, as we continue on the Bible roadmap. Let's, continue. Let's just finish in a word of prayer. Father, we want to thank you. We want to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is so beautiful. Your word is so rich. Your word is so amazing. We thank you for all that we have learned today. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you are planted in us. Planted. I'll help every listener to open the minds of their understanding. Father, you said wisdom is a principal thing that we should gain. Wisdom. And I pray that the wisdom will be, be, begin to sink into us and become a transformative power transforming us God and make becoming knowledge in us that we can implement in our life and we thank you Holy Spirit for your growth tonight in Jesus name Amen so I'll see you all take care love you